live. Thank you very much, Amy, for recording. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, I hereby open this meeting of the Council of Economic Advisors this uh, Wednesday, the 2nd of June, 2021. Um, good morning and welcome. I'm Adam Block, Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, this uh, open meeting of the Council of Economic Advisors is being conducted remotely, consistent with current state regulations, which we'll talk about momentarily, and is being recorded. Public access to this meeting does not ensure there will be public participation unless required by law. This particular meeting will not have public comment. First, we'll confirm that all members of the CEA are present. Uh, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, uh, Stu. Here. This is going to be one of those fun games of mute unmute. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Tina. Yes. Uh, Glenn. Here. Uh, Bill Day, we note is uh, is uh, absent today. Liz. Here. <clears throat> Virginia. Here. Bob. We see is present. Bob can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Can you hear me? All right. I'm here. Very good. Uh, Adam Meisner, we know is uh, running a few minutes behind, but will join. David Montgomery. Here. Rick. Here. Matt Telkoff. All right. We note Matt is uh, absent, but he may join perhaps after. We'll uh, keep an eye out for him and for Bill uh, as the meeting progresses. Um, Mike Wilcox. Here. Very much. Very good. Thank you all. Uh, for others participating in the meeting, please also be aware that others may be able to see you. Anything that you share or state will be a matter of public record. All supporting materials for this meeting, including the agenda, are available on the town's website at needhamma.gov. That's needhamma.gov, unless otherwise noted. Uh, some ground rules. Uh, uh, the ground rules for this meeting are designed to allow for an accurate public record. Uh, I'll introduce any speakers on our agenda after they conclude the remarks. Uh, council members will have uh, an opportunity to discuss, ask questions, or make any motions. Um, Again, thank you all for coming. Um, it's good to see the whole gang together, minus a couple of a uh, couple of us. But uh, it's very good to see everyone. Um, uh, I'm going to turn to the agenda. Um, we have uh, uh, have completed the roll call. We have our minutes for February 10. Uh, does anybody have any comments about the minutes? Hearing none, uh, can I please have a motion to approve the minutes of February 10? So moved. Moved by uh, Stu, do I have a second? Second. Second by Rick. Any discussion? Hearing none, I come to the vote. I'll do this by roll call. Uh, uh, affirmative aye, uh, negative would be nay. Uh, Stu. Aye. Uh, Tina. Yes. Glenn. Yes. Uh, Lise. Yes. Virginia. Yes. Bob. Yes. David. Aye. Richard. Rick. Yes. Uh, and uh, Mike. Yes. And the chair is I, all the, uh, those present, uh, the motion carries unanimously by those present. Um, uh, some updates from our subcommittees. Uh, I'm gonna take this in the reverse order on the agenda. Uh, first, I'll start with, therefore, the, um, I apologize. Uh, um, uh, with a cluster-based economic development uh, committee, this kind of brings up a couple of things. So just as a bit of a review, the purpose of the cluster-based economic development subcommittee 
is designed to um, identify different clusters of the, uh, of the economy uh, that we have in Needham and identify opportunities for um, uh, to look for uh, business development that supports that food chain. If there are, if we're 80% towards, let's say a life science, uh, a robust life science sector, but we're missing X, Y, and Z. One question is, what does it take to get X, Y, and Z? Because those types of jobs, if we're, I note that Matt Telkoff is, uh, is present, uh, the record. Matt, thanks for joining us. Um, we're just uh, chatting through some updates of the uh, uh, CEA subcommittees. So there, and it, this will also bring up questions about uses. Are there certain uses we want to continue with? Certain uses that make sense to abandon in various districts? Um, and ultimately the goal I think here is to, is to attract, um, is to deal with the mix of business, the diversity of business we have in town and also um, uh, attract new business, which would include new jobs. And these would be jobs at entry level, mid market and executive level positions. So this subcommittee uh, first has to deal with uh, a robust analysis of what consists of our economy locally, which is a data-driven exercise. Amy has been able to uh, work with um, uh, a student from the Needham High School to help with a spreadsheet and to start to clean that up, which is great. Um, depending on how much longer we have that student for, uh, it will uh, you know, uh, come to the to that subcommittee to come up with ideas either themselves to work through the spreadsheet uh, uh, to make sure that it's mostly accurate and um, uh, uh, and maybe do some of that work itself. The core work of that group will ultimately, uh, come about once that spreadsheet is done and an analysis can be conducted to identify what the scope of our economy is. And it's a challenge in a sense because we're part of a regional picture. And uh, Amy will look to Denise's office uh, uh, or staff in her office who might be able to point us to other uh, and make some connections for us uh, at other state level offices. Uh, so we can get a better picture of the um, regional nature of our economy, um, which would probably be helpful. Uh, so, and I realize that we're not going to be able to complete the spreadsheet overnight. We're kind of, uh, you know, it's it's a huge spreadsheet. It's a huge undertaking, um, and uh, and that's kind of what our goal is. Just to remind everybody. There are members here that are part of that subcommittee. Do any of you have any other questions about that subcommittee? One other thing I meant to note, and then I'll come back to you, David, is uh, that subcommittee is momentarily rudderless. I'm volunteering Amy to help in that effort uh, until we have a more permanent uh, uh, chair of that subcommittee because uh, we've lost our vice chair, uh, which will, uh, another subject that we'll come to in the agenda. Uh, uh, Anne-Marie, as you may know, has, uh, has resigned. Um, and, uh, and so we will need a new vice chair. We'll need someone to uh, uh, more permanently uh, lead that subcommittee. But David, I come to you. You had a question, your hand up. I was going to make sort of that same point that, um, we have a lot of goodwill on the committee, but we haven't really had um, a whole lot of progress yet. Um, and some of that has to do with that we lost Amy along the way. And um, we've also not had a complete meeting of everybody just due to vacation schedules and the like. So we still have to Do we okay. know when exactly the um, Amy, that file will be available or how long we have this individual to help us? The goal was to have him finish up um, in early June. So I need to follow up with him. I, ha I have not heard from him in a couple of weeks, but he was okay. um, volunteering his time to go through and, and basically 
check the accuracy of the business inventory list. So I need to circle back, but he was been steadily working behind the scenes to, uh, okay. to get it up. A couple, a couple of suggestions. One, it might be good to reach out to that student's teacher. We still have a few weeks left in school. There may be a couple of other students that would like to have some kind of summer internship possibility uh, where they could over the summer um, uh, help and maybe there's a group of students. Another thing is uh, I'd like to reach out to that professor Chasen from, um, uh, from BC and see if he knows any students uh, that might be willing to help with that exercise as well, either from his department or multidisciplinary from the Department of Economics. Um, given that it's urban development and you know he might know people either directly, students from his previous classes or uh, other um, disciplines. Yes, Adam, is this, a, is this an unpaid internship? Yes. Yeah. Could Do be hard to get a college student at this point. It could. Yeah. There was a, a group of students that did a whole sort of um, business classification use of um, of Needham Crossing area, I believe. Maybe I don't know if they did the downtown. I sat in on the presentation. Um, do you remember that? It was like a year ago, and they created like a database. So is that so? That was the Babson group, I think, and I think it was part of a bigger picture that's the source data that we're working for oh got it got it got it and uh they did an excellent job to create the thing it's accuracy um we still have work to do on the accuracy and then since the pandemic a number of businesses have changed uh so we're trying to get um uh it was helpful their exercise was was helpful it was a foundational step and they did an excellent job we're trying to perfect it now so we can more readily rely on the data. Um, so um, uh, I'll come to the small business uh, committee next. Amy, do you wanna chat about the small business subcommittee? Sure, so we had a subcommittee meeting in March, um, Virginia, Lise, um, Mo, Tina, and myself were in attendance and we invited Needham retailers to join us. And we actually had you know, a, a, you know, a decent number of folks show up. Um, so we had about eight retailers join us, which was really helpful because we were able to hear from them um, what the concerns are, um, not just COVID related, but certainly just bigger picture, uh, you know, retail continuing to be challenged uh, versus e-commerce. Um, Tina was in attendance, so I'll, you know, ask you to chime in um, with, with any thoughts or concerns um, that, that you thought, you know, rose to the top, but specifically a couple of areas. Uh, I heard from some Needham businesses that they were having difficulty attracting uh, staff uh, which is pretty much happening across the board right now. Uh, retailers and, and uh, restaurants are really challenged right now and in, in filling uh, vacancies with, with staff. It's a huge problem, uh, especially now with the restrictions being lifted and everybody going full steam ahead. Um, a lot of businesses are finding themselves um, in a pickle because of that. Um, beyond that, uh, there was concern about the lack of foot traffic in Needham Center. Um, and I think it was Tina that articulated a, a comprehensive marketing plan for Needham Center would be uh, something that would be very helpful. So just as an aside, um, actually it's due this Friday, but I'm applying for a grant through the um, One Stop for Growth uh, grant program through the state is actually, um, it's an umbrella program in which multiple um, state departments use this one grant. So I'm applying for funding for technical assistance through the Massachusetts Downtown Initiative to uh, work with a consultant to develop a marketing plan for Needham Center. So that's something that's, that's in the works as well. Uh, there was also a discussion about, could we plan events or promotions to attract more foot traffic to Needham Center? 
Um, at the time, you know, we were still under fairly heavy restrictions uh, as far as you know, public gatherings, that sort of thing. And then um, I attempted to put together uh, sidewalk Saturdays um, in Needham Center for the retailers to have outdoor retail displays and, and sort of coordinated promotion around that. But unfortunately, it didn't get much traction um, when I sent out correspondence and, and talked to folks uh, there. I needed a core group of retailers to participate in order for it to be successful and that wasn't happening. So unfortunately that's um, been put in the back burner, something to revisit for sure, because I think it, it definitely has potential to bring more folks. And now that the business restrictions have been lifted, which we'll, we'll get to um, further in the agenda, but it's opened up the possibility to be able to plan more things and gathering sizes are not restricted in, in the way that they were. So. Tina, do you have anything to add? Uh, <clears throat> the only thing I would say is that, um, I mean, unfortunately events like that are gonna be difficult right now because with a lot of the vacancies, we have a lot of holes in Needham Center. So it's gonna be hard to uh, incentivize people to come down and sort of walk the entire street. Um, I almost feel like you're putting the Carp before the horse where we need to focus on filling those spaces and making sort of making downtown a little bit more robust before we try to have events like that. It's gonna be pockets and people don't, I mean, in general, even when the street had, you know, very few vacancies, people don't like to walk from the post office down to Greensfield. So, it's a problem. I don't have a solution for it, but it, it's a little bit of a pickle. Made so, worse, made worse or more sour yeah. because of the number of vacancies today. Yeah. So, so not to jump ahead and, and get into the um, you know my my report, but you know there are measures being taken to address the vacancies. Um, we've got you know pop up shops that are actually going to be kicking off um, fairly soon. I would say by mid mid June to fill three of the vacancies in Needham Center. Um, and then the, the hope is that these pop-up shops would turn into more permanent types of businesses. Um, in fact, you know, one of them has expressed a, a huge interest in, in wanting to um, stay longer term. So you know, certainly that's the, the objective is to, is to get the vacant storefronts filled um, with, with businesses that will be of interest to folks to want to park and, and walk around Needham Center. And I, I know that there's a lot of other moving parts to it, um, but the, the hope is that maybe come fall, that we could coordinate some sort of effort with the restaurants and the retailers to incentivize people to want to spend, you know, an afternoon or an evening walking around Needham Center. Please. Amy, what kind of uh, retail is planned? So I cannot yet announce the brands because they're still being confirmed, but we have three spaces. We have the former Proud Mary space, which is at 1110 Great Plain Ave. And then we have 1020 Great Plain Ave, the former Needham Vision Center space, which is next to the new Proud Mary space. They moved into the former Polywog space. And then we have 36 Chestnut Street, the former bridal shop, um, which is next to the former Art Emporium space. Um, so those three shops, those three storefronts will be filled with pop-ups by mid-June. Do you have a sense of the categories of the businesses, if not the brands? In other words, is it uh, clothing? Is it gifts? Food? Yes. Yeah, so, so one of them is clothing and accessories, um, very similar to um, sort of a vineyard vines kind of feel. Um, we've got another one that is um, more focused on um, plants and um, interior decor, but not similar to what is offered at the other shops. That was that was an area that I was very aware of and very sensitive to, not wanting to bring in any temporary retailer that would be a direct competitor to um, an existing retailer. That certainly it's it. it the idea was to complement the offerings in Needham Center, not to, you know, create, you know, competition in, in a way that would pose any significant challenges for the existing tenants. Um, and then the third space is, um, it's 
a nonprofit that has merchandise um, that has their logo and, and sayings and it's it it's it's gonna be that and then um, there'll be another uh, pop-up that'll come in that has more sort of um, I'm not even sure how to describe it but it's uh, sort of essential oil reeky kind of stuff um, I know I'm being kind of cryptic but they're not 100% confirmed, but I, I do believe that they are going to be um, nice additions uh, to Needham Center over, over what normally is a is quiet time in the month, in the summer. Rick? Yep. Amy, Amy uh, the, uh, <clears throat> is the process yeah, for a pop-up much different than the process for being a, a uh, permanent uh, retail space? In, in what way, as far as um, applying to the landlord or to getting approval from the town? Getting approval from the town, and maybe I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit because we're gonna talk about uh, this sort of thing from what we heard from our Zoom meeting. Uh, but uh, re remember what we heard that it was very, very difficult for, for some of the retailers uh, who were discouraged from actually uh, going going ahead uh, because of the process. So with the change of use, um, the uh, the process is such that if it's if if we're not changing if it's if it was retail space and you're bringing in retail, it's it's not a change of use, so it doesn't trigger a change of permit. Yes, Bob. Amy, at the appropriate time, I, I think it would be helpful to kind of following up on Rick's point, just um, uh, if we could get a debrief on, on how these deals came together. Um, because in my experience, the, the trick with these pop-up deals is they're easier said than done because the economics are so challenging. You know, somebody, whether it's a tenant or the landlord, maybe in this case, the town, I don't know, um, has to make an upfront investment. Um, to make the space functional for, for their use. I, in the first case you mentioned, I, I imagine a uh, relatively high-end clothing store isn't just gonna move into any old space and try to make it work. So um, that would be instructive, I think, for this committee to understand how these, these come together and how they yeah. work economically. So these pop-ups are a result of um, a grant that was uh, secured um, in partnership with the city of Newton. So Deborah Balin, um, my predecessor, who, as we all know, is now the economic development director in the city of Newton, reached out to me in January to um, see if Needham would be interested in partnering with New Newton to apply for a grant through the Massachusetts Office of Business Development, um, which had grants available um, you know, sort of under the category of economic recovery as it relates to COVID. And so we put our heads together and also spoke to um, a woman by the name of Allison Yee, who is the founder and president of Up Next. And her niche really is pop-up shops. So the grant was really contingent upon enlisting the services of Allison to be able to coordinate all of this because there's a lot of moving pieces. So she has access to you know, dozens of brands and she has great experience in reaching out to landlords and, and sort of negotiating between the two. So she's the one that's helped facilitate all of this. So um, that's how all of this came together. So the grant was for $133,000, um, which helped you know, is, is helping to cover the cost of you know, Allison's consulting services, um, but also uh, it's helping to subsidize um, the rent to an extent. So the, um, again, the keeping in mind that the objective here is to bring in pop-up shops to infuse new energy into empty storefronts, but also to provide incentive um, for entrepreneurs who you know, may not otherwise have the opportunity to sort of dip their toe into um, seeing what it's like to have a brick and mortar shop. Um, so the re rent was reduced. Again, this is temporary. This is a three month program and that the remaining rent um, is is covered by a portion of um, the grant money helps to cover a portion of the rent and then the tenant pays the remainder of the rent. There's also funds in there for promotional purposes for um, bringing somebody in to sort of help set the stage for these entrepreneurs um, as far as um, display, uh, having folks with some background in, in retail merchandising, helping them to set it up. 
we're having local artists um, from Newton and Needham and, and also uh, the region display their original artwork in these storefronts as well. So, you know, without this grant, this program would not have been able to come to fruition. Is, uh, is the program also contributing towards the cost of any tenant improvements like um, uh, painting or uh, slight renovation, removing walls, building walls, however temporary? Um, there is a very small budget for some tenant renovations. And what are the terms? Do you know what the terms of the leases are? Are they three months, six months? It, it depends. So it, it, there was a lot of um, variables. There were over 80 applicants for eight storefronts. So there are five in Newton and three in Needham. And so the applicants indicated whether they wanted to be in you know, one you know, area or another, Newton versus Needham. Um, and then they also indicated how long they wanted the space for, whether they wanted it for two weeks or four weeks or all three months. So there were a, a lot of um, moving pieces and trying to determine, you know, Allison did a great job and, and I've you know, been on, um, you know, in meetings with her, you know, a couple of times a week for the last, uh, you know, two months to dis discuss this sort of, okay, well, this tenant is interested in this space, but they don't, want the entire space or they can't, you know, they don't have enough merchandise to fill the entire space. Let's find somebody to compliment and then finding somebody to compliment, but no, they're only available for the month of months of July and August. So what are we going to do for the month of June? So it, it was really um, a balancing act and um, the terms of the lease really vary based on the location and the tenants. So it's, it's all different based on those variables. Thank you. Uh, Lise. So I just going back to the sidewalk sale idea, it might be helpful for you to hear what um, happened in Wellesley. So the Wellesley Merchants Association wanted to hold sidewalk Saturdays and they had their first one, not this past weekend, not Memorial Day, but the weekend before they have scheduled with the town. Um, I believe three Saturdays, they wanted some consistency, but they're spread out. And so the first one was again, um, uh, this past weekend, they did with, arrange with the town to close Central Street. And uh, we had somebody from the chamber go up and they said you know, it wasn't a hundred percent participation. Uh, some people did bring out little pup tents and put them out on their sidewalks. Um, they, some kind of went into the street, but not really. They did have music at the one end, which people did congregate on. But the thought was the closing of the street was a little making it look like a ghost town. She thought maybe don't close the street yet unless you have a lot of activity on the street. And it also was really up to the merchant to um, participate or not. So just as Amy faced, some people just weren't really up for participating yet. They are going to try it again, a little more promotion, get the word out. Maybe a different Saturday would work. Um, but I did want to note that in some of the different blogs and we're trying to follow both towns and it seems like there's people in Wellesley that wish Wellesley Center were more like Needham. People feel Needham is pretty vibrant with the tent and on in the evenings, it really looks like it's come alive. And some people in Needham wish we were more like Wellesley. So there's a little bit of the grass is always greener depending on which community you live in. So Wellesley also has, and Mike Wilcox, I think can speak to this more. They also have a lot of empty storefronts right now. So they're also facing that same type of churn in tenants. We um, also have a... They also have art going on in those windows as well. It's good to hear that the art's you know popping up in these places. Um, uh, we also have the challenge. It's our geography is set up in a way that doesn't make it entirely pedestrian friendly. You know, and uh, that's certainly a challenge that we have to figure out how to overcome. I think to help um, uh, you know create more activity uh, in the uh, in the center. What's up with what's happening, Lise, with um, uh, uh, Newton Center? Are they uh, how are they positioned? And they have so many of the restaurants and they are continuing with you know, streamlining Piccadilly Square. That street Union Street is closed off. I think you need a lot of activity in the street to make it worth closing. Um, 
Newton Center just did better outdoor seating. I have to say, I don't have as much of a read on Newton Center. And because every village is kind of doing its own thing, it's a little harder to grasp a total picture of. Okay, I understand that. Um, Amy, do you have anything further from the small business? I don't. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next committee uh, is the district focused redevelopment committee. Um, and uh, um, we recently had, uh, was it last week, Amy? I think it was, it was May 25th. Um, we had a panel discussion uh, with, uh, you know, we invited the whole of the CEA and we had uh, others from the small business committee able to join us as well. Uh, we were able to arrange a panel discussion with um, uh, uh, one of the principals from Linear Retail uh, uh, Convisor Property Group, a, a, a retail brokerage, um, and also with uh, 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 Copley Investments. And first of all, I have to give a shout out to Rick for helping to, for jumping in and helping to arrange Joel and, uh, and Gary and their participation. I think it was very instructive um, and uh, was very helpful. I've liked doing these panel discussions. I'd be open to doing more. I'm open for other subcommittees uh, uh, to do these kinds of things as well, because it can help uh, inform the work that we do. Um, uh, and uh, the purpose of this subcommittee was to really talk more about you know, what's happening with retail um, we try to hit a number of topics um, and uh, what, you know, uh, what some of the trends were. Um, uh, um, we talked a little bit about the differences in our, in our areas geographically, the Heights, uh, Lower Chestnut and cent uh, in the center. Um, and we talked about uh, some of the challenges and um, Certainly, some of the some uh, one of the comments focused, I think, Rick, on uh, some of the regulatory work that could be improved or the regulatory framework that could potentially be improved uh, to help make it a little easier for business. Um, and uh, um, it's funny because, Lise, as you were talking about, you know, the grass is always greener from one side to the other. Uh, you know, that there was uh, um, some comparison to, you know, uh, to Wellesley and how, uh, how their downtown seems robust. And we talked about some of the differences uh, with Wellesley. It's a, it's a different uh, market. It's, you know, predominantly high-end retail um, uh, and it hits a different market segment. Than Needham does. Needham tended to be the observation was more of a service town, and so our retail hits a different uh, uh, demographic in some ways. Um, uh, um, we did we did highlight a few things that um, that bigger sidewalks can help improve the concept of pedestrian uh, attraction. Um, improved landscaping uh, and the critical factor was density. That seemed to be, I think Rick, is that a fair, a fair point that, uh, the that the predominant call was for greater density in the downtown to be able to attract more pedestrian activity? Right, well, that, uh, that spoke to uh, the idea of uh, vertical development having, having residential uh, within a walkable distance of the downtown. Uh, basically, so for, for everyone else who, uh, who wasn't in the meeting, the, the, the two people that uh, we had, uh, Joel Cadis from Linear Retail. Linear Retail invests in only retail and only strip centers and uh, downtown retail locations as, as investments. So they have a very, very good feeling uh, for uh, um, what what retail needs to be successful uh, at, as they are looking for properties to buy. Uh, they're looking for all the elements that support retail. Uh, Gary Simon from Copley Investments. Gary is a uh, is a, uh, uh, a pretty big owner of 
of this kind of retail in Needham. He owns the Sudbury Farms, the Dunkin' Donuts. Um, on Highland Ave, he owns the, uh, the farmhouse and CBS, uh, where Camelo's and Dedham Savings is, uh, the, uh, the gas station right across the street. So he has a, a pretty good feel with his experience with retail as well as the process in town and had some interesting things to say. Um, but uh, I, I think the overall uh, thing about retail in Needham is Gary, for example, said he looks for two things. He looks for density of, of uh, population and wealth and, and Needham has them both. Uh, the trouble is, is getting, getting people to uh, start participating in that retail. And that, that speaks to having, having it being walkable to, to the density of the population, um, both from a living standpoint and a parking standpoint. And we've talked about the parking situation in, uh, in, in Needham endlessly, it seems over the past few years. Um, uh, when, you, when we really thought about it, we have the parking to support uh, that, that type of foot traffic. It's just that people don't know where it is. Uh, it seems to be hidden behind uh, the storefronts. People within our town know where it is, but people who might be coming from the other towns that shop here, like Wellesley or Dover in particular, uh, don't necessarily know where the parking is. So it becomes a drive-through rather than a stop for a lot of people. And Adam, Adam mentioned to me, he said, well, you know, uh, well, Wellesley seems to be successful, which, which I would point out that, that Wellesley is a drive-through town as well, <laughs> Route 16. Um, yeah. But they have a length of sidewalk breakup uh, that, that allows, uh, seems to be more amenable to, uh, to that type of foot traffic. Anyway, that's, uh, that's what I got out of the, uh, that meeting. I think one, uh, one of the exercises that I'd like to embark on is probably to get <clears throat> the small business subcommittee here and maybe the district uh, focused uh, redevelopment committee to go on a field trip, to go to Wellesley and to go to uh, Wellesley Center to go to Newton Center and walk around, maybe have an ice cream or coffee or something, um, you know, for 20 minutes or a half an hour and make some observations and, and uh, you know, as compared to, uh, you know, to Needham, that can also be uh, a helpful exercise, I think. I um, think, uh, I, I think also, um, I think there's a lot of, similarities with Concord. Yes, Center. that was brought that was brought up and I would cons I would a field trip to Concord would also be a good idea because there too uh Concord is um uh uh it, it does have a, a, a um a historical significance uh that's more that seems to be more prominent than for instance in you know Needham and Wellesley. Um and that attracts uh a lot of tourism more than what we would typically get here and in Wellesley, um, but there are other observations to make as well. Uh, they too, and I'm not, to, it's not to say that Needham is not a, a wealthy town, it's all relative. And, uh, and certainly Needham, uh, you know, is, is, has become a wealthy town. Um, uh, but Rick, to your point, I think that it's true that, uh, you know, that it would be worthwhile to go through Concord as well. Yes, Tina. Uh, well, another thing that Adam Kinvisor had uh, mentioned toward the end of the conversation was that uh, in order for us to become something like that, one of those so uh, you know benchmark towns, we need a couple of anchor or sort of pioneer retailers to um, establish themselves here and that will attract other business. You know, he was saying that type of transition between getting businesses in here and turning things over, um, streetscape, all that. I mean, he was saying that that's could be 10 years out. Um, so I think that that's you know another part of the conversation is the time frame and really planning, thinking about, well, how does how does that look and how do you get from point A to point B if indeed it's going to take that much time. And I, I agree with him. I mean, um, I, I don't think that's an un unreasonable amount of time to think about um, that some sort of transition. 
I think that's I think that's true. We're also kind of it, dealing with retailers now. I mean, given just being being in the business, if I were to move here, and I wouldn't because there are so many empty spaces and it's very spotty right now, right? So for that's part of the things that you should be looking for as a small business. What, as Amy was saying, what are the complementary businesses? If you're sort of an island all on your own, you're making it that much more difficult to um, kind of jumpstart yourself out of the gate. I think so, that's a critical point. And it, you know, it's worth noting that you, know, you, you were a different retailer with a very different product mix you know, uh, on the main strip in our downtown. And, um, you know, and, and one of those businesses that, you know, could potentially transition through the turn. And yet, you know, the experience has been a significant challenge because although we have wealth in our town, uh, uh, you know, the high-end category, you know, I think has been challenged, right? Yeah, it has been. I mean, it, it's there is wealth here, but they're not spending it on local. They're spending on other things, right? They're spending on homes. The restaurants are booming. You know, we, we talk. There's been so much focus, and I've said this before, during, especially during the pandemic. So much focus on the restaurants. The restaurants. How many restaurants went out of business during this entire 18 month period? I know of one. How many retailers went out of business? At least six. So. Um, you know, I appreciate the push, but at the same time, it's a tricky place to figure out. Uh, and I think, you know, we personally, we have maxed our potential here and that's that's fine. I, I'm very grateful to the time that we had in Needham, but it's, you know, we could be doing a lot better elsewhere and that's why we're moving to Newton. So one of the things that I, uh, that I find interesting is we were kind of hoping that, um, uh, uh, that a business like Sweet Basil, I remember Rick, we talked about this a couple of years ago, that, um, that some stores would stay open a little later. And as you know, people are waiting for their table, for instance, at Sweet Basil, that they would wander across the street and, uh, you know, and, and wander into, for instance, Covet and Lou and other businesses that may be, uh, um, and help spur further economic activity, <clears throat> which I don't think re uh, was realized as much. But what I found interesting, Tina, in one of our own conversations was that there are other upscale retailers in, uh, in Newton on the same strip where you're moving to, which, uh, which can help augment and create that push to basically cross patronize each other's businesses. Uh, someone comes into your store and they, you know, uh, you know, they go, may go to a salon uh, or maybe have a need for a salon and there's easy cross promotion from one to the other, which hasn't really happened here. And it's, you know, it's a point that I think we want to look at Amy for the small business committee um, as we continue to, you know, find solutions to these challenges. Um, does anyone else from the district focused redevelopment subcommittee have any other comments or observations? Adam, can I just add one quick thing is that I was yes. just looking through my notes from uh, that meeting. I actually took six pages of notes furiously yes. writing down, um, you know, the, the great feedback that Joel, um, Adam Conviser and Gary shared with us. And one thing that resonated with me is what Joel said is that don't try to be something that you're not. Um, let's, let's not think that we're competing with Legacy Place or, or Natick Mall um, and that, you know, focus on your competitive advantages as far as, you know, the density and the wealth that exists in Needham. Of course, you know, to Rick's point, we want to add more density um, to generate more foot traffic. But you know there there are a lot of positive things about Needham Center and, and Needham in general. So I, I just sort of want to end on a positive note and say that you know we do have um, a, a a nice array of small businesses in Needham Center. I think we've got a lot of work to do, but um, you know Wellesley has Wellesley College. It, it's it's a little bit different. So we're not always comparing apples to apples. And it's at Talisa's point, you know it's the grass is always is always greener. Um, 
you know, when I ran Dedham Square, people would say, oh, how come we don't have any green space? Look at Norwood Center. They've got this great common and, and Needham has this great common. And then people have said to me now, oh, we wish we had the, you know, charm that Dedham Square has in a movie theater. So, you know, it's, it's always easy to sort of look at other communities and say, look what they have that we don't have. But let's also look at what we, we do have and, and build upon that. So, I mean, I think that there's a lot that we can accomplish, but I also just want to end by saying that we've got a great variety of small businesses, and I think we've got some some work to do. Absolutely. Okay. And Amy, to, yeah, to add on, make that same point. Oh, to add on to what Gary Simon said at the end was, if there was something to buy in Needham Center right now, he would absolutely buy it. Yes, Bob, did you have something else to say, and then I'll come to David. Yeah, yeah, just I was gonna I was gonna make the point that that Amy made, which is that. Uh, you know, we need to focus on what works here and encourage it um, and really not not resist it, uh, which I think we do sometimes. Um, you know, so, uh, and also the other sort of macroeconomic point that they made is that, uh, you know, the pandemic really just sort of accelerated the death of industries and tenants that were sick to begin with. Um, and so, um, you know, it was, it was really kind of a, uh, um, you know, the, the, the tenants that really aren't um, uh, geared towards surviving in an internet age really aren't really going to survive. And he says, you know, that's just much more complicated and involved than, than having a website. Uh, you know, it's really something, it's, it's, a, it's an art form unto itself. And so the, the tenants that don't have that skill are really going to struggle to survive in this new economy. I think the overall point is that Needham has fan, you know, has tremendous assets. Let's focus on the assets we have and maximize those to our advantage. Um, David, go ahead. Yeah, I was just curious if the um, the scope of you know, the vision for the district focus redevelopment subcommittee and and by extension all of us um, do we do we even imagine multiple districts that we should be thinking about because um, I mean we've talked a lot now about the storefronts on on sort of in the heart of town but I'm also imagining we had that presentation about Wexford Street and that area and we've had a lot of talk about um, Needham Crossing and I, I see those as all sort of uh, similar they have their own issues and, and there's a lot of potential in all of them. I don't think that the same issues necessarily apply to the storefronts on Great Plain as they might in Needham Crossing. And I'm just curious, is that, are we trying as a committee or, or as this subcommittee to um, tackle them in turn or tr some come up with some holistic vision of how, what kind of recommendations we make? I, I'm just not sure. It's a great question. And uh, um, the purpose of this subcommittee is to go through each of the districts. The first district that we've uh, that we're focusing on now is the uh, center business district. There was an opportunity with the with uh, um, uh, Professor Chasen uh, to uh, to look at the mixed use and Highland uh, 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 section uh, near the border with with uh, with Newton, um, and yet because of the sheer number of vacancies that have occurred in the uh, in the center, to uh, to focus our efforts immediately in the center, and then we'll go through district by district, understanding um, uh, understanding uh, um, uh, where each kind of submarket is. And what uh, what we can do, uh, what the challenges are, and to make recommendations uh, to overcome those challenges, and to work with really the uh, the planning board and the select board. Some things would fall through the planning board. Some things would fall through to the select board uh, in making whatever recommendations that are you know that are reasonable to you know to to improve each of those districts, and to also look at you know what the goals. You know the goals were, um, you know, in the original or in the current zoning scheme for those districts. <clears throat> um, uh, so we'll look at each district, and we can only do it one at a time. The, you know, the, this is not going to be a, 
you know, three month thing and, and we've studied the whole of, of town. Uh, it may take a few months to study, you know, a district. It might take six months to study one particular district and then we'll move through as we need to. Does that answer your question? And we'll- I think we'll... it does. I, think it does. I, I guess I would just sort of, I'm gonna to try to remember, remember that as we, as we look at a, any one district that maybe the solutions that we're seeking to um, may apply better in one of the other districts, that's all. So the, sub, so the subcommittees will, will uh, um, come up with recommendations, but it's not gonna be work done completely in isolation. We will continue to report back through the overall CEA because that's an important observation that you're making, David, and we wanna you know, have that robust discussion as we, you know, before we finalize anything because it's gonna be, uh, you know, the idea is for these subcommittees to do their breakout work and then come back and report through and others that have not been participants of that particular subcommittee may have a different perspective that can help inform the overall work product by the end. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, does anybody else have any other comment or question about our subcommittees and the work that we're doing? Yes, Virginia. Um, so it sounds like for the near term, the small business and the district focus just need to keep meeting together, if I'm following what you just said. So that's a very interesting point. We, uh, there will be times where it makes sense to do that on certain kind of activities, and there may be times where it doesn't necessarily make sense to do that, depending on the actual work and the agenda. That okay, has but we... You know, it's like it would be kind of silly if we had the same kind of panel discussion, not knowing you guys had it. Correct. So we want to make sure that our efforts are coordinated. Right. I appreciate you bringing it, that up. Yeah. And it seems like when we did this a couple of years ago, it's such an overwhelming task. And I agree with Tina, we need like the long term vision. But we, we should probably also start to hone in on what are some short term action items to do in 2021, because they need to kind of get planned. We can't just raise our head in September and then hope to do a few things. I, I uh, understand that, and we that would be great. You know, we're not. Um, you know, we intend to meet. Uh, ideally, we'd be meeting a couple of times a month with these subcommittees okay. to be able to do the work. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Amy and I will definitely chat through what you're talking about because it. You know, we can also uh, having more people in that sense might on that particular initiative could help and we want to make sure that our efforts are coordinated there may be some aspects in the same geography but you're looking one group is looking at one part of it another group is looking at a different part of it we do want to cons you know ultimately uh, uh coordinate the effort we don't want to duplicate that's not what's going to happen yeah. uh and the point about you know trying to achieve some uh you know actionable items uh, in the short term would be helpful, but if it, but I don't want to rush the process either. I want to make sure that, um, I mean, one of the things that I think Rick talked about and, and Virginia, you were certainly an equal part of this group beforehand. And so are you, Stu, and when we walked through and went door to door, one of the observations was, you know, we need parking signage. Well, we got the parking signage and yet the parking signage I don't think is as uh, vibrant as perhaps it could be. Um, mm -hmm. We may want to look at perhaps changing that, you know, those signs to make yeah. it more prominent that they stand out more. Um, Rick, you've certainly brought that comment up before mm -hmm. uh, that the signs aren't as visible as we would want them to be. Um, so, so We'll have we yeah we'll keep that in mind and thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, I'll turn to Amy for uh, our, an update on our state of emergency with the governor and that's now been rescinded. Yes. Yeah, so as of June fifteenth, the state of emergency will be lifted in Massachusetts, um, which allows for 60 days after the end of the state of emergency, which will bring us to August 15th, um, for the continuance of many of the provisions that were outlined in the, um, in the orders. That includes um, outdoor dining. 
I can tell you that um, there have been several internal meetings um, with department heads, um, you know, Lee Newman, um, myself, and others uh, that have discussed at length um, the future of uh, outdoor dining. And it is indicated that there is legislation currently pending uh, for the governor to continue um, outdoor dining through the end of November, um, but we don't know when that's going to, you know, if that's, if that's going to happen, how, how soon it might happen. So we are um, having discussions internally about what can bring us through the rest of the 2021 season. Um, so I know that, um, you know, the planning board certainly is discussing it and the select board is um, discussing it. And we're working behind the scenes to set up the framework to allow for that to happen. And then um, sort of longer term than that, as far as looking at, um, next year. Um, I have had individual conversations with retailers and have also you know, reached out via email just to um, sort of hear from folks about the interest level of wanting to continue um, outdoor dining. We are hearing you know, tremendous support from it for it from the residents. Um, certainly the restaurants want to continue it, but there is an impact on, on parking. Um, the parklets do take some on-street parking spaces as well as in parking lots. And so I wanted to check with um, the non-restaurant businesses to see if there were concerns. And uh, I would say overwhelmingly, what I'm hearing is that um, there is support from the non-restaurant businesses to continue doing this uh, because the vibrancy that the outdoor dining has added to Needham Center um, as well as the increased foot traffic. Um, sort of the benefits of those two outweigh um, any impact of losing parking spaces. Uh, so that's, that's the general consensus. Um, and, and so, you know, as I mentioned, we're continuing to work behind the scenes to set up the framework. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than it seems. It's not a matter of just saying, sure, let's continue outdoor dining. There's special permits that are impacted. Um, you know, with regard to um, you know, planning board, if they're on public parking spaces um, or you know, public sidewalks, it impacts you know, public property, which involves the select board. So there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done behind the scenes, but we're, we're committed to uh, being able to move that through and, and, and find some solutions to, to make outdoor dining um, a more permanent fixture in Needham. since we're dealing just a, a, about COVID that, um, you know, the, uh, the town is looking to open things up significantly and to extend, um, for instance, the outdoor dining policy through, I think, leave the end of October. Um, you're muted, Lee, sorry. Sorry, um, yes, the planning board last night actually voted to extend its outdoor a dining policy um, through um, October 31st or whatever the governor, um, whatever the legislature adopts, whichever is later. Um, so basically to waive its regulatory framework to allow the outdoor dining to remain um, in place through that timeline. So, you know, we're, we're still new to, David, I'll come to you in a second. Uh, we're still new to this reemergence out of the pandemic and it's worth noting that um, you know that the pharmaceutical companies you know uh, are still figuring out a plan for what uh, vaccine may require you know a booster, so to speak, that we've heard about. And uh, as we've you know as we relax, as other areas have uh, some of the restrictions, the masking and social distancing, and so on. That's great for those that are fully vaccinated, but there are still a number of people that are only singular vaxxed and are not fully vaxxed. And there are a number of people that will not get the booster. So, uh, you know, we don't really know what's gonna happen. We hope it will, you know, we reemerge and we're open uh, in a sustained way like we were before the pandemic. But it's certainly possible that we may go through some other kind of a wave, not as drastic or dramatic uh, before, but it's possible. And, uh, you know, we, you know, we should be mindful that, you know, we're not fully out of the woods yet. And, uh, you know, until a greater population has been inoculated. David, go ahead. Probably should have read the Needham Times a little more thoroughly than I did, but there were, um, I'm curious as to whether the 
um, folks who are regularly in committee meetings have been hearing, uh, is there a plan developing for um, when and if we can no longer meet in this fashion um, with the, the governor's um, lifting of restrictions, how does that affect us? So um, I can turn to both Lee and Amy for perhaps more of an official uh, answer. Um, I think that work is being, uh, that question is being asked and there is legislation in the, uh, particularly in the state house that's circulating that has not been resolved yet, but we hope it will be soon. I don't have a timeline of when it would be resolved, but that legislation would enable municipalities to um, uh, uh, reconsider how it does um, public meetings in a uh, virtual or not virtual, partially virtual, that allows for uh, compliance with the open meeting law. So it could be some kind of a hybrid model where there is a general requirement that we return to, um, uh, to the physical meeting place. Uh, and that if a member, if one member is unable to do it physically, but can do it remotely and certainly not on a regular ongoing basis, because the expectation is the majority, vast majority would be returning to the physical space to meet that uh, that it's got to be equally open to members of the public to be able to participate and observe uh, through, you know, a virtual means like Zoom. Um, I think, uh, Lee? Um, I think just following up on what Adam said, um, I think that the governor is, is, is like the legislature is continuing an extension of our current protocol under Zoom um, that would run through, I think, September the 1st um, in the town. And then there's also legislation uh, it's, it's been introduced uh, for a longer term solution that would look at really how we actually conduct meetings, as Adam talked about, with either remote meetings or a combination of remote and in person. That's a longer term solution. And I think under the current open meeting law, um, a town is able to allow for some remote participation. It's, it's restricted. Um, it requires a quorum of the board to be present with the chairman present and two board members can participate they have a five member board remotely um, and the public has to have remote access and that requires adoption from the select board um, because once it's a, approved, it, it's applicable countwide. So there are a couple different strategies that are being examined currently. And right now, just, just in planning and community development because we're advertising hearings um, and we are not really quite sure where we're gonna land. We're advertising for meetings after June 15th uh, an in-person meeting and a Zoom option provided the governor's extension through September is uh, implemented. Amy, do you have anything else to add? No, we pretty much summed up. I would just, I would just like to throw out that um, I can appreciate that obviously the governor has a big say in this and, and the town would presumably have its own voice, but we can have our own in terms of ex expressing what we want. And I would want as much hybrid options as possible. I think that it's a real savings of time for a lot of people. It makes it convenient to participate when otherwise it can't. Um, and I don't see any, I'm not in favor of, of an expectation that you must come, you can only like uh, participate remotely occasionally. I think, I think participation should be encouraged in whatever form it can be. So I don't know how to register that other than say it out loud here, but it, to the extent we can communicate that on up the chain, I'd be in favor of it. And I would, I would just add to, to what David said, um, you know, from what I'm hearing from my clients as well as what we're doing as a firm, I mean, most organizations I know are staying hybrid. Um, you know, there's not gonna be this rush back into the offices. And uh, I know our firm, like for example, we're taking every partner's office and we've converted it into basically shared space and we're all going to hotel, you know, we just let the firm know the day, the two or three days we're going to come into the office. So that idea, I think will continue. My sense is it's going to continue across the country. So like David said, if we can have that option, so it's hybrid um, and give options for people to dial in, I think it, I think it makes a lot of sense. Hey, that would be helpful. Um, I know that I'm, uh, at their meeting on June 8th, we're going to be considering options. Um, so I think, if this board wanted to communicate their preferences to the selection, that would be beneficial. So 
So what I'd, what I'd uh, recommend then, uh, uh, Amy, is that we send a note to, uh, to the select board, um, you know, to let them, to let them know that the CEA would recommend as flexible a hybrid model for participation remotely and physically as possible. Um, uh, one thing that we're dealing with is, you know, is the immediate term and the other is uh, me, uh, the immediate term, the medium term, and then the long term. Because I think, um, uh, uh, Matt, what you were talking about, that's, it seems fairly common that a lot of business, uh, office-based business is going to run in a similar model through Labor Day, but then after Labor Day, there'll be an expectation that more people return to the office. Uh, but, you know, all, there's no standard. You know, companies, some small companies, different with large companies, some are requiring masks, some are requiring vaccination, some are not. Uh, uh, the Globe had a good article yesterday, I think, uh, as a result of, uh, you know, that uh, a survey that the, uh, that the chamber had conducted, the Needham Newton Chamber, regional chamber had conducted, uh, you know, it showed a third of businesses, I think, are um, requiring um, uh, vaccinations and a third are undecided and a third uh, are not. So it's, this is still an evolving thing. Um, Stay tuned in our notices for what will be required. We're uh, notwithstanding our own recommendations, whether it's a physical thing or a Zoom thing, um, and you know it's still to be determined and resolved for the immediate term, uh, the uh, midterm and longer term strategy. But Amy, let's offline. We'll make sure we communicate our message, uh, which I think is pretty consistent. As do most people tend to agree, a simple nod would do or. A, a shake would do yes looks like we have uh you know a chorus a majority of uh a vast majority unanimous uh yeah uh, no i'm yeah i i think the hybrid model is, is here to stay i for one am looking forward to getting back and meeting in person i you know i i think there are, are limits to, to zoom calls and I, I don't think there's any substitute for getting together but uh you know clearly um you yeah. know this, this technology is, is here to stay and so is this format. So I don't object to that, but I, I am looking forward to seeing everybody in person someday, very soon. So Bob, you want to get, you want to get back to wearing pants? <laughs> don't stand no, up, don't like stand I said, up. Some, some things are here to stay and, uh, and, and <laughs> comfortable clothing is one of them, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> very funny, Rick. Um, uh, I, I got I have a quick question now. Uh, since we, since we mentioned yeah. the uh, select board. Yes. Uh, who is going to be the representative on the CEA oh. from the select board? So we have some uh, uh, um, administrative matters that, uh, that we need to attend to. Uh, one of which is ultimately have a vice chair, which probably uh, will, will take a little bit more time to resolve. And Rick, specifically to your point, um, that's not been determined yet. I think, Amy, uh, Amy, is there a date that we anticipate? I was told very soon. So, so it, it'll be within the next couple of weeks. So uh, without getting into anyone's individual politics, uh, one thought I had, regardless of who actually is the uh, participant from the... Um, uh, from the select board for the cluster based economic development committee. Uh, you know, given Lakshmi's uh, expertise in data research analysis and um, uh, entrepreneurship, I, I think that she, if she is, um, uh, the, you know, even if she's not the person, I may consider wanting her to help with that particular subcommittee for that project. Um, uh, but we'll see how this thing evolves. Um, uh, and then just, I guess, an, another note, I'm the representative to the CEA from the planning board and uh, um, uh, the planning board's uh, priorities are gonna be focused on 
uh, kind of town-wide activity, one dealing with uh, you know af affordable housing, another dealing with sustainability, um, and uh, and the planning board is interested in working collaboratively with the CEA on uh, you know some of the review that we're doing through these individual business districts. Um, uh, you know, which is great that we can, uh, you know, coordinate activity and, and to, um, you know, to support them as, uh, even though we report specifically to the select board, um, uh, you know, that we can work closely with the planning board, I think, and also help the overall effort uh, that we can leverage the expertise and the time here, uh, you know, to help uh, with some of the overall effort. David, go ahead, you have a question? I was just going to uh, underscore that um, I think that uh, in general, I mean, obviously it'll take a little while before we know who who our own uh, select board person is. But um, I, the I think the goal or a quest that is worthy uh, is to try to understand this new configuration of the select board. Um, you know, setting aside that they have two new members, they also have two new. Uh, they have a chair and a vice chair that's new. And, and so getting sort of a read on, on what their new priorities are um, as they uh, come into, into that role, grow back into that role could be helpful for us. Um, and trying to open those lines of communication with them. That's not unique to this committee. That's something that I've seen in other committees that I'm part of that you're always trying to get a read of, well, what, where are the priorities now? And I, this is we're ripe for that because it's the annual it's not long after we have a new configuration as well as the end of the pandemic so that's, um, that's, that's a good point david thanks for bringing that up uh the planning board is has begun a process to solidify its goals coming up for the year and i expect the uh select boards doing the same and we will certainly note whatever uh, uh economic development priorities they have we, uh, we have already met. I, uh, I met with uh, and Amy with uh, the chair, vice chair of the uh, new select board, um, uh, with Matt and uh, Marianne to identify what we saw as our priorities and goals uh, for uh, for the CEA in particular, and we've had their support and endorsement of our activity. So we'll continue on in our own way, but we'll obviously, as we report into the select board, we'll be mindful of what their priorities are and so on. Um, uh, Amy, do you have a report or update? Uh, just a couple of things that I haven't yet spoken about is um, the artwork displays in the empty storefronts. Um, a couple of months ago, we started uh, with a storefront gallery in the former Lisa's boutique space at 1520 Highland Avenue, um, you know, the, right from right across from the common. Um, and so that's turned over actually a few times. Uh, it's in partnership with the Needham Council for Arts and Culture, which I staff that committee and the Needham Art Association. So it's been um, eight to 10 um, pieces of original artwork from Needham Art Association members um, to display there. And it, it's definitely um, added some you know, new energy to that that corner. It's it's nice to see people stop and browse and 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 get, you know look at the the artwork. In addition, um, thirty two and thirty six Chestnut Street, so the former Art Emporium space and the former um, Bridal Shop space, have also uh, been storefront art displays. The Art Emporium space for a couple of weeks was actually the Needham High School Senior Art Show. Um, which was really awesome because the seniors um, who had been working so hard on their projects all year long did not have um, a place to actually showcase. They could not hold uh, a normal art show like they do every year. So um, with, you know, in partnership again with the Needham Council for Arts and Culture, um, Charlie Nanda, who heads that committee, is, um, has tremendous energy. And so uh, she approached me and, and talked about wanting to find a, a home for the senior art show. And so I reached out to the leasing agent there and, and they were tremendously uh, gracious in, in providing the space. Of course, the, there's a new tenant going in there soon. It's gonna be an orthodontist um, office and, and they were very generous. And in, in even though there's work going on behind the scenes to get that space ready, they were um, very amenable to 
having a storefront art display. And then right next door, Needham Open Studios has been showcasing um, local talent um, and work in their storefronts as well. Um, and that continues to be up. But um, I think it was not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before, Representative Jake Augenkloss uh, did actually a tour of um, Needham Center and, and the artwork that's being displayed. And that includes the Jersey barriers that have been painted again, another partnership with the Needham Council for Arts and Culture, thanks to um, their coordination and me being the liaison between them and, and the restaurant owners <clears throat> in, in the town. There was some funding that was contributed from the Needham Community Revitalization Trust Fund, as well as the NCAC to help provide some artist stipends to uh, pay for some local artists to um, decorate the Jersey barriers in front of Sweet Basil. And if you haven't had a chance to see them yet, they're pretty striking. Um, really, really um, add a lot of color and um, you know, vibrancy to Needham Center. Uh, Sherwin-Williams donated um, about $1,500 worth of paint and supplies for this effort. Um, French Press also did their Jersey barriers, but um, Jay Spencer's partner, Jose, who is a very talented artist, uh, actually did those um, on his own. And next up is uh, Pancho's Taqueria. So there's two members of the NCAC who are donating their time to paint the barriers there. And um, I've also heard from from Hearth and from the farmhouse who are interested in painting their barriers as well. So sort of nice to add a splash of color and some creativity to uh, these outdoor dining displays. And so I've already sort of referenced all of the other things going on between, you know, setting up the framework for outdoor dining and uh, project pop-up. Um, those are sort of the major things that have been going on um, as well as seeking the technical assistance through um, the Mass Downtown Initiative. So that pretty much concludes uh, the major things that I have to re report to the committee on. Thank you very much. Uh, Lee, do you have uh, any update on permits issued? Sure. Um, I can't remember um, when I last reported to you, so I'll just, I might be covering some projects that we've already talked to you about. But the planning board did issue the permit for the Carter Mill building, um, which was 83 units of memory care units and 72 independent units with six affordable units. And so I anticipate that that project probably will be built out over the course of the next year and a half. Um, last night, I think as Amy mentioned, um, in the art emporium space, the planning board approved the permit to allow an orthodontist um, to occupy that space. And that's at 32 Chestnut Street. I guess just on that issue, I, I think maybe Adam, as the committee is beginning to do its examination of zoning across districts, I think it would, it would be helpful to understand how the community, how the committee feels about utilizing um, first floor spaces in Needham Center for office related uses, because we're beginning to see some erosion on the first floor space in these kinds of medical uses. Um, when the downtown plan was originally done um, back in, I think, 1989, um, the goal was to have really retail and restaurant space on the first floor. Um, the zoning over time has kind of eroded that um, in terms of this regulatory framework. So I would be very curious about how this committee feels about um, the, the um, transition, which, begin, which is beginning to happen now, with some of that first floor space in the center itself being utilized for office or medical related uses. Um, so looking forward, um, Needham Gateway, which owns the property where Panera Bread is at 100 Highland Avenue. Um, has got a permit application in front of the planning board. We currently have a permit in place which restricts their um, use potential at that property. Um, it was designed initially to eliminate high, high parking generation uses. Um, they're having some difficulty looking at lease ups, and so they want some flexibility to um, move outside of some of those restrictions, which limited um, them to um, not having restaurant on, on the facility because of parking concerns or a bank type of use. So that's scheduled for the 29th. Um, and then uh, French Press has approached the town. They're interested in expanding their space into where Elite, um, um, the Elite space was um, on Chapel Street. So that's going to be scheduled in front of the planning board. And then just in terms of a broader issue, just briefly, because Adam touched on it already, the planning board did start to talk about its goals for the upcoming year. Um, and on the table, of course, is affordable housing um, and looking at who 
inclusionary zoning and developing a comprehensive affordable housing plan for the town moving forward, uh, looking at um, implementing some sustainable development principles on zero, um, zero, net, well, zero net development as an offer. And we did talk about um, re-examining the check. Lee, I'm, ha I'm having a little trouble understanding you. I'm sorry. I'm in my office for the first time in a year and four months. The first time I used the system here. I've been, I've been, been in my family room for a year and, and I, had, I had a down pat. So I don't know, that, am I talking too fast or is it the video or the audio or what? Yeah, I think it's the audio. audio I'm getting every other word. Oh, okay. Well then they, they need to fix this. <laughs> this, is, this is my first Zoom meeting in my office space. Um, if I'm breaking up, then um, that, that's the end of my report. You mentioned some, what was the last thing you said about sustainability? Uh, yes, we're also looking at, they're also looking at sustainability um, and how that might be implemented in a regulatory framework, um, reaching out to other organizations in NEDA that are working on those issues and make some assessments as to whether or not there are some regulatory changes implementing to encourage more sustainable green development in need of. Um, so that's and then the last what, what, what does that mean uh, sustainable redevelopment uh, it might it might mean looking at incentives to upgrade buildings that are net zero so they're beginning to in, implement solar technology so that there's um, a reduction um, in their in their overall energy draw so it might be green roofs. Um, I think the, the town's going to be exploring what alternatives are out there um, and what other communities are, are doing in that sphere. I think probably Somerville and Cambridge have some ideas um, that we need to be looking at. Um, but again, that's at a very, very preliminary level of that kind of examination. And then the last project relates to the Chester Street corridor, uh, which is the area of town where we thought we would get the most development out of the downtown plan that was done in 1989, in large part um, around perhaps medical related office uses. So I think um, examining um, the Chestnut Street Corridor, the regulatory framework, having some conversations with the hospital in terms of what their goals and objectives are, uh, to see if there are some, if there are some regulatory constraints that are impeding um, the redevelopment that we had anticipated along that corridor. So those are key areas planning board talked about um, uh, as potential goals for the next year and they are yet to decide how they're going to prioritize them. Yeah. Rick. Um, if, I, if I understood this correctly, one, one of the things that I think is a very slippery slope is the idea of converting uh, storefront, first floor storefront to office. Retail cannot go to the second or third floor. So for every office that takes up a first floor storefront, it's one less retail uh, opportunity. Um, so if the idea is that you want to create a, 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 you know, a retail situation, um, you know, for the constituency here of Needham, you know, as we've been talking about in the downtown area, uh, every time you convert a storefront to office, that's just one less reason for people to be walking up and down the street to uh, to shop. So, it's, so I just be careful. I think that that's. I think we need to. I think that's that that's an issue that probably needs to be examined, and a policy decision needs to be made. Because in '89, it was clear that's what the town's goal was, but then some amendments in, that happened in zoning made that goal less clear from a regulatory standpoint. And so now they're stepping into that, um, uh, I, I would call it gray area of the zoning. So if, if it's decided that that's the goal for the center, then the zoning needs to be modified to clarify that. So Bob, go ahead. I, I just think we need to take a, uh, a pretty uh, specific look as to what constitutes office and what doesn't. I mean, I, I think the orthodontist office on Chestnut Street is going to generate more foot traffic than, than the Art Emporium and, and, the, and the bridal shop. So I, I don't think all what we consider to be office 
they're not all created equal. And I, I think Good we point. distinguish between the two. And, and um, what's interesting is uh, the planning board had previously interpreted like a dental office type use uh, as not being applicable uh, within the then zoning. But in 2015, <clears throat> it, was it was argued that, um, uh, that based on the zoning itself, that there was this provision not enumerated elsewhere in the bylaw that uh, was, uh, I don't have the, the zoning article um, uh, in, in front of me, but it's basically consumer, consumer services dealing you know, directly with the public that's not enumerated elsewhere in the bylaw. And it was on that basis that in 2015, another dental practice was uh, approved uh, for first floor space on Great Plain, I think. And so, uh, and, and that's a newer interpretation and the applicants, uh, uh, the applicants attorney for this particular space you know, argued on that basis and the planning board unanimously agreed it's mindful of trying to preserve the retail nature of the first floor because Rick that's obviously a critical point how can you have any robust retail if there's no physical space for retail to happen and you're right you know retail in North America is a uh, you know it's not a vertical enterprise it's a first floor enterprise um, and, and, and yet, Bob, you also make a very interesting argument too that, um, you know, that we have to understand the use a little better and understand it's not that we want to have, you know, fill all of our office spaces with, um, uh, uh, or sorry, fill, fill all of our first floor spaces with office. That's certainly not the goal, uh, but we have to work with the regulatory framework we have and uh, you know, as any landlord does have to consider any reasonable tenant um, or prospective tenant. So um, it could lead to, uh, you know, uh, uh, recommendations to improve the zoning in some way um, uh, that kind of balances the, the overall goal and the ability within the marketplace. And that's one of the things that we'll definitely be looking at. So I'm glad that uh, Rick, you uh, raised that question, and Bob, I'm glad that you uh, 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 raised your point as well because that's helpful. Um, Lee, do you have anything else to add in your report? No, that's all. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions or other business? Seeing nothing, I'd like to thank again everybody for coming. Uh, we, I anticipate that the CEA will in itself meet as a whole like this uh, in September. And yet uh, stay tuned because we will be having uh, subcommittee meetings ongoing. Um, and Virginia, to your point, there may be certain initiatives that we'll embark on together and some that we won't. We wanna coordinate uh, those efforts. And uh, uh, that's all that I have. Would anybody like to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Moved by Stu, seconded by Rick. Uh, uh, any discussion? Hearing none, we'll come to the vote. I'll do this in the order in which I see people. Uh, David. Aye. Stu. Aye. Mike. Yes. Please. Yes. Bob. Yes. Tina. Yes. Matt. Yes. Virgi uh, Virginia. Yes. And uh, Rick. Yes. Am I missing anyone? I don't think so. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, oh, uh, Stu, did you have your hand up or you're just saying goodbye? You're waving. All right. Um, yes. Adam, Mike. just uh, one, one note. Um, and Lise, you may have more details, but uh, I don't know if Everyone got copied on Greg's email about uh, sending an email of support to the city of Newton in regards to the reconstruction of the bridge over the Charles River. Actually, there was three alternatives. One was uh, build a new bridge. The other was um, rehab the bridge. And 
I can't remember what the uh, maybe build a new bridge in a new location, I guess. Uh, so there's two scenarios of building one in an existing location, one in the new. But we see it here in the park as being a very critical connection to uh, amenities, uh, the new Northland project, you know, potentially getting vehicles off the road. Um, so I, I don't know if people saw that, but the, um, the comments are uh, due today. And um, if, if people need that, I'm sure at least can send around the, uh, mm -hmm. the contact of the person in Newton that uh, this goes to. So in particular, Lise, what I'm gonna ask you to do, and Mike, thanks for bringing that up. Lise, can you send that directly to, um, uh, to Amy and myself? And sure. then subsequently, Amy will send it to the whole the CEA. Um, yeah. And then we can take uh, uh, take action. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. I uh, appreciate you all being here and uh, enjoy the summer. Look forward to working together over the course of the summer. Keep well. Keep safe. Bye, everyone. Thanks, you too. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye.